This is Do It For A Living, your source for inside information on the future of automotive performance. Completely pivot everything you're doing and gear it towards the customer itself. Really focus on what you can do to make their life easier. If you put them first, then everything else will fall into place. What's holding you back from starting or growing your business into what it can be? Well, if you're listening to this, it's not a lack of information. What you're about to hear is all you need to get motivated and start making waves. Do It For A Living podcast details the journey of today's true players in their own words. Find out how they broke out so you can too. The time is now. The time is always now. Welcome back to another episode of Do It For A Living. I'm Kevin Dubois. Uh, today we've got Chris Rode, uh, founder of Studio Road. Uh, he's a marketing company and he's a active participant in our Do It For A Living community on Facebook. And he's provided a lot of really cool insight in I actually perused his webpage when he first joined the group just to make sure he was uh, kind of vetting him. And I was really intrigued by some of the content he had on the site. And uh, he's had some really cool blogs and he even does uh, some um, webinars that I participated in. And he, he's got a lot of very good content that most of it is free for everybody to kind of look at and participate in. And then I, I believe he offers the service, but I'll let him kind of fill in as far as what he does. Chris, how are you doing today? Doing fantastic. Thanks for the intro. Cool. So why don't you go ahead and get started and tell us your background. So kind of tell us, you know, like what you did growing up, how you got involved. I guess cars is your forte as far as marketing goes, but you're not a mechanic. So um, go ahead and kind of fill us in on your background, education, that sort of stuff. Yeah, definitely. I'll get into a story in a little bit about me not being a mechanic. But yeah, so so the story starts with me. I am the founder and glorified graphic designer at Studio Road. We are, uh, Studio Road is a brand strategy and digital design agency specifically towards the automotive aftermarket. We have a lot of roots in motorsports and we do have clients within motorsports. <clears throat> um, yeah, it started off um, not too long ago. Uh, I initially started Studio Road in 2001, um, kind of moonlighting, and actually made it official a few years ago. Um, so been going strong ever since. Okay. And what kind of education do you have? I attended the Art Institute of Atlanta from uh, starting in 2001. I went there for advertising and graphic design. Okay, I was going to say, it has to be something graphic design related because that's one thing yeah. that really drew me to the web pages is how like pretty and simple and easy to use it is. And this is something that I think is definitely overlooked with just about every web page related to car stuff I see. Uh, most of them just pack as much information as they possibly can in there and they kind of become overwhelming and you can tell there's there's the content is there to get across to the people visiting the site but there's definitely no flow no uh um thought into, yeah i mean it just really is kind of a mess and uh, you know I, i'm guilty of this of myself I, my evo dynamics page was literally made in a day by myself so i just <laughs> took a template and did it, you know, uh, but our, the, my shop is this page we did. We actually had a graphic designer do the current layout, which is now it's probably about three years old. So it probably needs a refresh pretty soon, but yeah, it's a, uh, that's something that we have not talked to anybody on the podcast about is graphic design. So hopefully you can kind of fill us in a little bit what that is all about. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you're, where are you out of right now? Knoxville, Tennessee. Knoxville, and have you been there the whole time? No, no, no. So I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. I moved to Atlanta in 01, as I mentioned, to go to the Art Institute of Atlanta. Uh -huh. um, met my girlfriend um, 10 years ago in, and, and it ended up moving to Virginia, this small little town called Big Stone Gap, Virginia, a few years ago. It had, it had a, I think it was a bilo and like one, one stoplight. Lived there for a year, ended up going to Aiken, South Carolina. Uh, worked for a, uh, the Savannah River site, which is a, a nuclear plant. They're kind of, it, it sounds daunting and, and, and dangerous, but it, it's really not. They're, they're, they're decreasing the footprint of that nuclear plant. So I was their lead graphic designer and helping getting out assets and, and uh, digital materials to, for the public. Uh, worked there for a few years, then ended up going to here in Knoxville for an agency, or at an agency, ended up working at a, uh, Excess Power, who makes, uh, you guys might, most of the yeah. listeners might be familiar with Excess Power, right? So uh -huh. they make performance batteries, if you wanted to put them in a nutshell, performance batteries. So I worked there for a couple of years as well. And um, 
and then uh, now I'm doing my own, my own thing. Okay. And uh, I mean, do you really think of yourself as an entrepreneur? Did you go to start your own business or was this kind of happenstance that you just kind of did it? You know, that's, it's an interesting question because throughout high school, it was before high school, throughout middle school, I was selling stuff. I was selling blow pops and I was selling, <laughs> I was selling cinnamon saturated toothpicks. And this was my dad's idea, by the way. <laughs> yeah. We saturated toothpicks in cinnamon, the cinnamon solution. And the idea was, is that we can make it for a half a cent and then sell it for 10 cents. And you would just suck on the cinnamon toothpick throughout the day. It was just kind of this, the, this, I don't know, this little thing you would just do. And, um, you know, the markup, the, the margin on that was insane. Um, <laughs> probably I, looking back, it was probably the best business I've had thus far. I should go back to that. But <laughs> it, um, so I started with that and I kind of got caught in the vortex of how life is supposed to span out, right? You're supposed to go to college and get a general job working at a nuclear plant, like I said. You're supposed to go through these steps and throughout all of that process, in the back of my head, I always knew like, I don't want to work for somebody. I want to do my own thing. I'm seeing stuff within this business or I just, I need to do my own thing. I don't like the way this is being run and, and I didn't have the authority or power to do anything about it. So at a certain point, um, and that point was 2008, I was working at an agency and in my off time, mostly at night, I'd get home and I would moonlight. I would do graphic design till probably one, two o'clock in the morning. Um, side note, I made in that year, I made more money doing graphic design by finding my clients via Twitter than I did from the salary at the agency. <laughs> All like, right. Twitter was insane for me in 2008 and part, part of 2009. Then everybody started to catch on and I, I bailed out of it, but. At that time, I was just like, you know what? I need to go and do my own thing. So um, shortly thereafter, I took Studio Road full-time, haven't looked back since. What made you want to quit the full-time job? Uh, the desire to do my own thing, be my, be my own boss, have full control to a certain extent. Okay. Um, just to see what I could reach. You know, so when you're in a, a structured environment, there's a ladder that you're, that you're allowed to climb. Mm -hmm. There's a vertical you're allowed to climb. And um, it takes 20, 30 years, especially in the government, you know, working at Savannah Riverside, that's a 30 year gig for you to get to the top of that ladder. That's 30 years. I didn't like that idea. I didn't like that time frame. I wanted to get somewhere faster and I had higher aspirations for myself. So I knew the only way for me to do that was to go out on my own and do my own thing. Okay. And you are, uh, I mean, because what you're doing is obviously almost entirely computer based, you're not you don't have to have a, a shop. And so the cost of doing business is, other than software is, is minimal, right? You I mean, you could do it out of an apartment or do you have, did you have like an office to begin with? Right. So I work out of a home office. We just bought a house uh, nine months ago. I work out of a, it's the, <laughs> admittedly it's the biggest room in the house, but that is my office. And, um, yeah, so I don't have a traditional brick and mortar. And the primary reason for that is most of our clients are on the West Coast and or internationally. So having an office just, it doesn't make any sense. On top of that, having an, off, having an office, none of my employees are here in Knoxville. Well, actually one is, but most of them are not here in Knoxville. They're, they're around the world. Most are on the West Coast. So it just doesn't make any sense. And I don't want to base my hires and the people that I bring on based on geographic geographical limitations. I want the best I can get my hands on. If that means they're in South Africa, awesome. If that means they're in Washington, awesome. That's all I need. And and you just utilize Skype or Google Hangouts or any chat messaging, Slack, whatever yeah. it may be, huh? <laughs> all D, all the above. Right. <laughs> cool. Okay. So have you ever kind of doubted yourself and like wondered if this doesn't work and how are you going to overcome that feeling and move forward? You know, I, I'm too busy taking over the world for that. I just, I have my aspirations. I have my goals that I'm looking for that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to obtain and looking back just slows me down. It's, it's like running, right? So if you're, you, you said you're a runner, uh -huh. when you're running, you run the fastest when you're looking ahead. What happens when you turn your head and look who's behind you or look for what's behind you? You end up slowing down 
or veering off course. Mm -hmm. So I just, I don't even, I don't waste my time. I don't look back. Interesting. They're different. Look, most people have something. <laughs> and so then do you have like a worst experience you've had in business? Being complacent. That is by far my worst experience. I mean, there's other little small innuendos, but a couple of years ago, I, I got, it was real good. Business had been doubling each year after year. It was, it was looking good, right? So I got complacent. And I wasn't doing anything for business development. I wasn't doing anything to bring in, in more clients. I just, I was happy. And um, what ended up happening was my sales funnel dried up and that wasn't good. I didn't maintain the momentum that I had built up. So I've learned from that mistake and won't make it again, but I've learned from that mistake. And um, looking back uh, just briefly, that that would is what I would classify as a, as a worse business experience. Awesome. Yeah, I've uh, <laughs> getting complacent is, is different for me. It's usually working very hard, but you don't focus on moving forward. You just work really hard on what you got here. And, and then three months skip by and you're like, what have I been doing for the last three months? I've been working, I've been paying bills, but I haven't really moved forward at all. You know, And that's something that I think most shops struggle with tremendously is, is being complacent. Treading water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, treading water. And I, I just gave one of my buddies, Keith, uh, the analogy of a hamster wheel, just spinning your wheels in a hamster wheel, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Great analogy. Okay, so what's something you're doing right now that has you fired up? Um, this Saturday, actually. Uh, so we submitted – there's a bit of a backstory to this, but I'll go and tell you anyway. We submitted some work uh, to some – to uh, to the Addy Awards and the Addy Awards are it's basically just a, a bunch of it's for the ad, it's for the advertising industry um, and the design industry to a certain extent. Um, there's pros and cons to it. The pros is that if you win if you win awards from the Addy Awards, it brings in creative talent. They you get attention from the creative talent that you need. Um, but the other side of it is that it, it, in, it inflates my ego because it, and, and to a certain extent validates what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, so if I had to pick, if something is firing me up right now, it would be the Addy Awards. We submitted some Addy Awards for this year for work we did last year. And, uh, we got wind two weeks ago that some of the submissions have won awards. Oh, wow. They won. <laughs> To my chagrin, they will not tell me which one's won, but um, I'm pretty pumped on any of them winning. If any of them win, even a silver, uh, I'd be I'd be pretty stoked on it. So I'm excited about that. Um, to the listeners, even though that excites me, again, that's based on my ego. I like having that to a certain extent, and it's an experiment. I want to see if those awards. Does anybody actually care about those awards? Do they, do they care enough to to come in and actually do business with us? It, to a certain extent, it is an experiment. Interesting. Well, if the shop that's listening to this and they're going out and they're looking for an agency or a designer and they're, that agency or that designer has a bunch of awards, that's not for you. That's for them. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> well, congratulations on winning the award, even though you don't know what it is yet, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll keep you updated. Okay. Okay, well, let's let's kind of move into the uh, the the company itself. So, Studio Road. Um, I want to talk about the mechanics of the business, and then I want to kind of get into like, uh, you know, I mean, you bring a lot to the table here as far as like how people can like look into marketing and and design and you know social media and handling all that stuff. And so we'll cover that next. But uh, tell us about your business first. How many employees do you have? So we have four, and uh, then we have an army of contractors. Okay. So lots of people for very specific tasks that you may need when you need it. Right. I want the guy that if he is if he is extremely talented at typography but doesn't know jack about anything else, excellent. That's the guy I want. And what is is it typography as in like fonts that kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Um, not to get too nerdy on you, but yeah, it's um, when you notice a font. And you're and you kind of question it. That means the designer wasn't very good. <laughs> okay. But if you don't notice a font, then the designer did its job. Okay. Well, I can honestly say that I've never ever worked with a typographer. We just kind of pick a font. <laughs> right. Cool. right. That, that's and then, that's and good that's, to know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a designer nerdy thing. Like there's there's characteristics about certain fonts that display a certain message. Like papyrus 
And Comic Sans, Comic Sans is for fourth graders, right? You don't use it on a Fortune 500 company's letterhead. Do you, do you, do you see the dynamic there? Like, <laughs> even though that's an extreme example, uh-huh. that's the take on it. So wingding is not one we use very often, huh? <laughs> Please no. <laughs> okay. All right. And so you got four people as actual employees and then the rest are contracted. And contracting works out especially well for you because the specialties are, are so niche and everything that you need to have somebody on tap to do these unusual tasks where, you know, unless you are a Fortune 500 company, you can't afford to pay somebody to do just that specific task. Absolutely. It's all about overhead. So by using contractors that are specific in a, in a certain task or a trade or skill set, I can keep my overhead low. Do you find it difficult to manage all these people or is it pretty pretty straightforward? It's really straightforward. At, well, I, I'll step back. At first, yes, it was a struggle because I didn't have the systems in place to manage it properly. And over time, you learn, much like a shop, they, they get employees in and they get project cars in and stuff like that. You start to develop those systems. Once you get the systems in, it's it's super easy. Okay. And how many hours a week are you working? <clears throat> uh, 90. Okay, so you're doing all day, every day almost, huh? I do 10 to 2, 10 to 2 Monday through Saturday, and I'll probably sprinkle in some hours on Sunday. 10 to 2 as in like 10 till 2 a.m.? 10 a.m. to 2, 2, 2 a.m. Okay. <laughs> I was say, that sounds like four hours a day. That's like 20 hours a week maybe, <laughs> but okay. Right, right. I carried the one. <laughs> and you said you had a girlfriend. Are you? Is it still a girlfriend? Are you married? Do you have kids or anything of that sort? Oh, man. I hope she doesn't listen to this. Yes, yeah, it's still a girlfriend. Oh, so she's going to be mad then, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, every day. I had a nine-year-old walk up to me at a at a um, basketball practice or soccer practice the other day, and she's like, "When are you going to put a ring on it?" It's like, "Ah, uh. <laughs> nine-year-old's calling me out, man." Does that affect your schedule at all, or does she not mind you working those kind of hours? A little bit of both. It depends on how. It depends on the motive, and it depends on if you know. It, there's a conversation or conversation around work-life balance. Um, I prefer work-life integration, right? So she helps me a lot with the projects that come in. She helps me with the strategy and creative and stuff like that. There's a lot that she brings to the table and she loves doing it. So by integrating her into, into my work life, it's a really, really good mix. Cool. And, uh, and you know, we spend our time outside the office and outside of work as well. Okay. And you're working out of the apartment anyway, so you get to see her all day, even when you are working, huh? Well, yeah, the house, yeah. Oh, the house, yeah, okay, sorry. Um, and do you find the pay justifies the time spent? The short answer is yes, definitely. Okay. It's not just a labor of love. <laughs> You're making some money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I got enough to, to – I'm comfortable, sure. Okay. Um, but like I said before, I've, I have certain aspirations and goals that I'm trying to reach, so the, the money is just a byproduct of that. Okay. And what are the primary tools of your trade? Um, and, and usually this is like QuickBooks and Outlook, but obviously I'm sure you have some like design tools that you're using, huh? So you mentioned Trello earlier. That's one, and Basecamp is another. Um, and again, since my background is graphic design, the Adobe Creative Suite is a is a staple. Uh-huh. I open that at least once a day. Okay. Do you guys use like Slack for your communication at all, or what are you using for that? Or is it all done through um, uh, Trello and uh, um, Basecamp? It's so it's uh yeah it's through Trello Basecamp a lot goes through text messages believe it or not okay uh you know with iMessage it's easy to to pull up iMessage on on the Mac and and just kind of communicate that way um I did not know this I don't have a Mac <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> again design, nerdy designer guy over here yeah so most of the people that I, I end up working with um, on the contract side are Mac based okay so Mac has its own instant messenger that ties to my phone. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. Let's pause for a second to thank our sponsors. We all know owning a shop is difficult, so we created My Shop Assist to help you manage the various jobs. Whether you run a machine shop, a performance tuning shop, build off-road trucks, or even do powder coating, My Shop Assist can help you. It is completely online and will help you schedule the jobs, log time on each task, track parts orders, and take pictures of the work. You can even export your jobs from My Shop Assist into QuickBooks as invoices. So if you're interested to improve operations at your shop, check out myshopassist.com to start your 30-day free trial. Okay, so we're back with uh, Chris Road of Studio Road. Um, and I wanted to talk more about you know your actual 
focus of marketing and design and social media and all that sort of stuff. So let's go ahead and uh, start with, first of all, what you see people making mistakes with first. So tell us what you see wrong and then kind of guide us in a direction that people should be looking for for correct things. So what do you see wrong with like, especially web pages, maybe Facebook usage and paid advertising? What is wrong is that our peers are really, really romantic about how they've always done things. They, they've, they've been in business 30 years. They've always relied on word of mouth. They've always relied on magazine ads, um, which I might get into in a second on the magazine ads things, but they're buying banner ads. They're doing video pre-rolls. They're, they're not giving, they don't want to give people advice unless they're paying for it. And they're not investing in into mobile websites, which baffles me. Um, and the reason it baffles me is because at no point are any of us that have a smartphone, minus the guy that's run, still rolling around with a Nokia, all of us with a smartphone are never more than three feet from that phone. You know, like, I just don't under I don't understand it. it. It's not 2008. Like this isn't some mobile is not something that is coming. It's already here. We're fully engulfed in this thing, but people are still questioning our peers that we admire are still questioning the mobile aspect of this whole thing, whether or not it's worthwhile to invest into it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, granted, I'm a little biased on the subject, but that's a that's a huge frustration for me. Um, because so many, so many, so much of our, our culture is moving to mobile. And I actually pulled up my Shopify stats here. So when you're done, I'll, 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 oh, did you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you, if I had to guess, um, <clears throat> if I had to guess your mobile is in between 30 to 55%. Oh, it's mobile. much higher than that. Uh, so, yeah. well, so my top browsers in the last 90 days, uh, the number one is mobile Safari. Number two is mm -hmm. Chrome, very close to it. So those are about the same. Um, right. Then number three is Chrome Mobile. Then Internet Explorer. Then number four is Samsung Internet. And so probably more than fifty percent of it is uh, more than fifty percent of it is mobile. So there you go. Yep. All right. So us not wanting to invest in mobile. Your website getting, in your particular example, your website having 50% mobile, that's 50%. If you are not mobile, 50% of, of your potential earnings, you're just throwing in the trash. Mm -hmm. Just done because you don't want to invest in mobile. It's, it's honestly, it's that simple. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. And, and actually, I'm now looking at this. It says top de device type. Yeah. It's uh, more than 50% mobile. It says mobile desktop tablet. Tablet being a tiny fraction of it, desktop, uh, probably about, that's probably uh, maybe about 45% and 55% You know what's interesting mobile. about that is that the majority of your visits are going to come from a mobile, say an iPhone or a Galaxy, uh -huh. but iPads in general, tablets in general, have a better conversion rate. Interesting. I did not know that either. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm looking at this further. Facebook linking is almost nothing, um, so that's like less than less than one percent. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. sorry, uh, maybe a couple percent, which I was that's surprising too. I would have thought it was a lot higher than that. But <laughs> okay, so making making web pages obviously, um, you know, mobile friendly is obviously something lots of people mess up with, and I admittedly have visited a lot of people's web pages that don't have mobile sites or there are regular sites that you have to, you know, adapt to a phone, you know, zoom, pinch zoom, that sort of thing. The importance of mobile is the customer experience and how that matters in the conversion funnel. A poor customer experience in general. So a poor customer experience is, is making the customer jump through hoops of fire on their way to the register, right? Here's an example. If, if you're running a brick and mortar, if you have a shop and you're running a brick and mortar shop, you, you wouldn't ask the customer to go to the counter and insert their information or present what products they want to buy and then go across the street to enter their credit card information. And then after they're done with that, they have to call a 1-800 number to put in their mailing address. <laughs> That's absurd. We just wouldn't do that. It'd be, 
it just doesn't make any sense to do that. We wouldn't do that because if one, it would create long lines and it would a massive amount of frustration or worse, it wouldn't create long lines at all because simply nobody would want to shop there. Mm -hmm. Because you wouldn't do that in a brick and mortar, why would you do that digitally? That's the point. Okay. And, uh, I mean, what about Facebook usage? I mean, you touched on people's web page design. Is there any, like, no-nos for Facebook that you see? Well, I can tell you one. Yeah. Organic organic reach is dead. It, it, it's just dead. If you have a business Facebook page and you're just posting on there and you're not putting money behind it, you're wasting your money. Wasting your time but, as in – your money as in the time you spend in no, your Facebook? No, you're wasting actual – quantifiable money you're wasting your money or, or i'm sorry i see what you're saying yes time you're you're wasting your time um the better use of using facebook is to to put money behind it to do what's called facebook dark posts facebook dark posts are posts that end up in somebody's timeline but are not posted on your timeline your your actual business profile and the importance of that is is that you can pinpoint who you want to target if you want to target a 24 to 36 year old male that's involved in bracket racing, you can target him. You can also target that same person and you want him to make $150,000 or more per year. You can also target that guy. So you can get really, really specific on who you want to see that ad. That's in regards to Facebook. That's where you put the money and the time. Okay. And so that, that, applies to you know like what you're advertising with as far as like your facebook page itself like i mean there really is not a whole lot in, into it like just make sure you have because i always see people say oh you should be posting three times a day you know all that sort of stuff like i personally don't follow any pages that post that often they, they even they just have too much content and i just don't care anymore is that kind of is that does that make sense or is that is that something people should be doing it doesn't matter the amount of times you post it's what you post that's that's the key. Okay. If it you can post you can post cat videos all day long, or you can post you can post whatever you want all day long, three times a day. But if if it doesn't map to what the end consumer is interested in, it doesn't matter. It's all about the the content itself. So f Facebook provides the framework that enables you to get the customer the consumer's attention, right? Mm -hmm. Much like this podcast, your podcast has set up the framework for me to acquire the listener's attention. If this pod, if the value that I'm bringing to the podcast, what I'm saying doesn't bring any value. If it sucks, it means nothing to me and it means ultimately nothing to you, Kevin. Right. It brings no value. The same on Facebook, the same on Instagram. If you're not bringing any value, if the consumer doesn't care, if you're talking, if you're just sitting on Instagram and Facebook and all you're doing is bragging, that means nothing. Like you have to bring them value. You got to pay forward to this thing. And, and, and going back to Facebook ads, by the way, there's a ton of people that are listening to this that have run Facebook ads and they haven't worked. So they got rid of them or they don't understand why. And the reason they're not working is because they're selling. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that one, right? I personally have not run any Facebook ads with my with my shop. So I haven't uh, I haven't uh, had to worry about that. But um, I have dabbled with it a little bit on our the MSA software side. And it is super hard for me to know what to market because I don't know how to do it, right? So this this is not my wheelhouse. So <laughs> that's why. And then to your point on, you know, providing value, the reason, yeah, we're interviewing you is because I feel you kind of like can shine a light in an area that I don't understand. And I feel like a lot of people don't understand as well. So the value is there, right? So, you know, obviously this podcast has value to myself and hopefully everybody else listening. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I mean, your objective at first is to acquire their attention and their attention is based on the creative itself. It's the image, it's the video. That's what gets their attention. And once you have their attention, you have the leverage. Anybody who has the customers, the consumer's attention has all the leverage. But the other key is the content, content itself. So once you have their attention, content, it has to deliver, much like this podcast has to deliver each and every time. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's really the variable there. You know, you, you got to deliver one, you got your foot in the door. If you don't deliver, they're out. So that's a, that kind of takes us to the next thing here. So we kind of talked about what people were doing wrong. So how do we know what we should be doing? And I, you know, like more or less, how do you know if you're, you're doing what you should be doing correctly? 
in a nutshell, it, it's really paying attention to the, what the, what the customer is telling you. And a lot of, a lot of people say they do that, but their actions are speaking louder than the words. They say that they're really good at customer service. They say they're really good at this. They, they say all these things, but they don't have mobile sites, for example. Mm -hmm. they, care, they care about the consumer's experience and they care about the consumer's desire to be able to navigate via mobile, but they're not doing it. You know, they're not responding to, to, to Facebook messages and Instagram com. That's a big one. Instagram comments, oh my God. I can't tell you how many companies are posting on Instagram People are underneath and they're putting comments in. They're asking about the product. They're asking about this and that. They're engaging with the brand itself and they're completely ignored. Okay, and I'm, that sucks. I'm guilty of that on YouTube. <laughs> it sucks, man. Like from a consumer standpoint, because we're all consumers, mm -hmm. that sucks. If I had to give one piece of advice, it would be to completely pivot everything you're doing and gear it towards the customer itself really focus on what you can do to make their life easier. If you put them first, then everything else will fall into place. Okay, let's carry that onto the web page design then. So when you're looking at designing your web page, um, you know, what are you looking for first? I mean, mobile is obviously a part of it, but that does not define the design of the page and what is essential to have on it and you know, like what should it do? You know, you know, how do you rate pages and know what to improve on them? I, real simply, I reverse engineer the customer itself. So how we do that is we have something, uh, it's a discovery framework. We call it core. And throughout core, that framework, we're able to determine the customer's needs, their pain points, why they want to acquire something, the brand messaging. There's a bunch of different variables within that discovery framework. And based on the answers that we discern from that, we can reverse engineer it and we can design the assets to exceed, to one, meet those needs and then exceed them. And by assets, I'm not talking about just website. That means across the board, the entire marketing branding platform and as a whole. That means Instagram messaging, comments, everything. Interesting. Okay, so you are looking at the, you're not just like, you know, like this is how I design my page and I, I would, think that a lot of people kind of follow suit you just kind of think of how you want your page to look like and you just start adding pictures and text to kind of put what you want on paper there but you are looking at it let, let me make it a little bit more practical then because that's how we do it and a way that a listener that can do this tomorrow or tonight a way they can implement this is that they can go to their customer service department and they can map out the top five questions that that customer service department gets every day or every week or every month, the most popular questions that they receive mm -hmm. over a given, given period of time. Whatever those answers are, design the website with content or media or assets that answer those questions. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. That It's simple. Yeah, that's it, it can be as simple as that. Our discovery framework, it, it, it's very complex and it costs a lot of money and all. it doesn't have to be be that way it can be very very simple you just ask the people that are talking to the customers and you just reverse engineer it okay and then implement whatever you discover so using the web page to answer the questions before they even ask the question right exactly okay awesome okay and you know like we kind of touched on like the uh, you know like how you um design the pages but like the graphic design part of this is I mean, yours are so well designed. Like you, you look at it and you're like, wow, this is like excellent. Even though it's simple, it's very simple. Like how are you applying your art skills to this? Like this is something that I have never even considered, but obviously it makes perfect sense when, you know, you, you look at it and do it. But you're, you're basically making the CSS and the HTML with your art skill to look pretty, right? I mean, how does a shop apply that? Is, is it apply, apl applicable to uh, templates? Like, you know, a Shopify page, can you beautify a Shopify page? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think for most shops that are listening to this, that are within a certain gross revenues, let's say, let's say one, one and a half million gross revenue a year. I think you should absolutely buy a template. It's the bang for the buck is phenomenal. Where we come into play and other designers and agencies and all that stuff comes into play is whenever you start reaching a point and you hit this glass ceiling, and 
you're losing a crap load of money because the conversions aren't there. You're getting all this traffic to the website, but nothing's converting. That's where we would step in, right? That's where you really have to focus and pay attention to the ex the customer experience on the digital side of things. So that's where design, to answer your question, Kevin, that's where design comes in. Okay. It's not about design and typography and all this. It is to us, like the whole ego thing, like we want beautiful things. There's a branding element to that. We want to feel validated. We want the customer to see that we're serious and that we're going to be here for a while. We're investing. We are investing into the company. We want to project that message. But more importantly, the design itself is specifically geared to push them through a sales funnel as efficiently and quickly as possible. And that goes well beyond just design. That's looking at their pain points, as I mentioned. That's looking at how they're interacting with the site. If we see that they're going, they're jumping over from step one to step four to get to step five, then we need to re-engineer and we need to design the site in that way. The aesthetics of it are merely a byproduct of all that stuff. It's it, it's important to a certain degree, especially from branding conversation, um, but there's more to it than that. Okay, so you in your design process. So if somebody hires you to like redo a web page, first you're you're looking at the customers, kind of analyzing them. Then the second thing you're doing is looking at what kind of content and you know like you, the five most common questions that people ask. You're, you're you're answering those questions, and then you're looking at like the brand of the company, and then you kind of design the page based off that. Is that is that kind of the process that you guys apply? Right. In a nutshell, yes. So a lot of times, and it's unfortunate, and in full transparency, I started off like this. When a customer came to me or a client came to me and they asked for a web design, I would implement what I liked. I like these colors, I like these fonts, I like this layout, here you go. Here's a big surprise, voila, here's your new site. They either loved it or hate it. The proper way to do it, and what I learned through trial and error, <clears throat> as I mentioned, is that we reverse engineer the customer. We find out what their pain points are, how they interact with the site, how they're interacting with other sites, what they're doing, the digital actions of what they're doing. And then based through that discovery framework, we can decide and, and discern what and how to lay out the website. That That's it. Everything. Once you do that, everything else is easy. Easy for you. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. And I mean, I... I I pay attention to design, like it comes naturally to me. Like my ADD is very, very powerful. So when I go and I'm walking around the street, I can look around and I see typography and signs and colors and graffiti and architecture. I see all that stuff and I'm taking it all in. My benefit is that I can flip that and make it digital. But that's just me, like that that's my inherent skill set. I've learned how to do that. It comes naturally to me. The importance of design is that it makes it easy for the customer to go through it. It makes it easy them, for them to find what they're looking for efficiently. To a certain extent, it's not about colors and fonts and all that stuff. That, that's us. That's us on our side. But what the listener should be focusing, focusing on is how that design interacts with the customer itself. Does it map to what the customer is looking for? So in other words, if you're, a hard, if you're a custom motorcycle shop, you're not going to design your, your website like you sell bridesmaid dresses. It doesn't map. It doesn't work. Even though, again, that's an extreme example. Mm -hmm. That's the point. Okay, so can we apply this to uh, the same sort of idea to Facebook? Like what kind of content should people be posting then? Like, you know, you, you just said like a motorcycle shop isn't trying to sell stuff, right? They're not going to be selling stuff with ads. What kind of content should they be posting on their Facebook feeds? There's three silos of content that actually work, by the way. Again, most of the content that's being deployed right now is all sales. That's all they're doing because they're in the sales business. They're used to selling that. I understand that. I have empathy for that. But in terms of actual content that works better than the sales content, it comes into three silos. There's educational content. There's escapism content and entertainment. Escape, are you, Kevin, are you familiar with Casey Neistat on YouTube? Uh, no. If you ever get a few minutes, jump on to Casey Neistat's uh, YouTube channel. And he does this, or he used to do this daily vlog. He would just record himself, just walking around town, doing his business thing. He had a startup. He, he started a social media company. He, okay. he created these videos that went viral. And what ended up happening in, in regards to escapism is that 
every day he would post a video and it'd be about 10, maybe 20 minutes long. And every day people, millions by the way, would watch his videos to escape life for that 10 to 20 minutes. Okay. He was entertaining. He didn't necessarily provide value, but he was entertaining and he gave the viewers an opportunity just to escape just for a little bit. Okay. Right. That's escapism. I guess you could, you, could, you could apply like sitcoms on, you know, evening TV was, uh, I guess, the same kind Perfect. of uh, yeah. idea. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. By the way, all this map, like everything that's happened over the last 50 years, it's all the same. The only thing that's changed is the tools. Okay. Radio, TV, newspaper, magazine. It's all the same stuff, right? It's all the same. It's just the tools are different. Uh, so the other one is entertainment. Entertainment, very briefly, I mean, that can be cat videos. That's entertainment. It's funny as hell. You know, so we jump on YouTube. We watch one cat video. Four hours later, we're still watching cat videos. Okay. That's entertainment. So to answer your question, educational pieces are probably the most valuable to the customer's of the companies that are listening to this. So rather than selling something, if, if you're selling tires or coilovers, or rather than straight up selling it and the value of that coilover, that, that value proposition is for the company itself. It's not for the customer. It may seem like it's for the customer, but it's actually for you. It's for the company itself. Instead, show visually how to install that on their Evo. Show them how to, how to install a tire with out a tire mount show them all this stuff like again going back to the customer service thing all the customer service uh, the questions that customer service is, re is receiving there's your there's your pain points right there build content build videos around those questions okay makes sense and and mm -hmm. educational videos or at least educational content is in my opinion, the only thing I even want to post on Facebook anymore because I really dislike just, uh, I guess, the entertainment stuff. Sometimes I like, <laughs> I'll post a video if I'm at a racetrack, I guess. That's about it. But like, I don't post yeah. anything on any of my Facebook pages unless it's like educational. And that's actually a really good point. So there's another conversation behind that. Well, Chris, everybody's posting how to install coilovers on an Evo. How do you differentiate, differentiate yourself? So rather than creating the same content that everybody else is creating, by it, you should create and you should document your adventure and your procedures throughout the day. You know, they want to see the people behind the business because that's the one thing that is not scalable. Nobody else on the planet can scale Bob that's in the back of the office or John that's in the shop wrenching on, on whatever. Nobody else can scale that. So that's the one thing that you have as leverage moving forward. So if you want to create content, yes, you can create educational content. There is value to that. It's evergreen. It'll be there forever. Um, make it as specific as you can, putting coilovers on an E46 or an Evo, et cetera. But on top of that, document the shop's adventures and just how you do business. If, if a customer comes in and they have a great experience, document it, top to bottom, front to back. If you have a car built, document it, front to bottom, top to all of it, just document it, both visually uh, with photos and video, document the whole thing. And if I had to recommend one thing on top of that is, is go with video first, if you can afford it, go with video first, because from that video, you can kind of pie it down into, into text and imagery as well. So you can scale it. You can get one, you can pay for one piece of content, but then scale it across the board for much, much less money. And then how do these things help with branding and, and what importance does branding actually have? And, and like, how do we improve that? Here's the importance of, of branding. If you've been on Instagram for any period of time, you've probably noticed that there is a crap load of companies that are built on the backs of these platforms, the backs of Instagram and Facebook. There are, they make 60, 70, 80% of their revenue from those platforms. So what happens if all those platforms just disappear? What would have happened if your company is running and getting most of its revenue from Instagram and f when Facebook acquired Instagram, they shut it down rather than putting money behind it? What would have happened to your business that is? Well, you would disappear. <laughs> exactly. 
Yeah. So without brand, without branding, without a community, without a tribe, you're at the mercy of the platform itself. So you know, having brand allows companies to experiment and fail forward without losing too much market share. And a great example of that is BP, the gas station, BP. Like, what a colossal screw up the oil spill was a few years ago. But guess what? We still get gas at BP. So, and that's a that's a conversation that, that, that I've been noticing, not the BP conversation, but a conversation that, that I've been noticing within our ecosphere is that people are afraid to jump on to a certain platform because they're afraid it's going to disappear. Snapchat, for example, right? They're afraid to jump on Snapchat or Musical.ly or to a certain extent, Instagram still because they're afraid it's going to disappear. And it doesn't matter if it disappears. If you have brand, you can take that branding and put it anywhere you want. There's a there's a quote, I, I believe it goes, sales, is, sales will make you rich, but brand makes you wealthy, right? As a side note, I'm not suggesting that we all uproot our sales initiatives, um, but some of us have hit a plateau and we're not quite sure how to break through. We're just only concerned with the short-term results and, and survival, if you will. At the current point, you know, most of most of us have uh, we've done all we can with picking the low hanging fruit um, and developing a, developing a brand, building a community or a tribe will help us, help us break through that gap glass ceiling. I, I see exactly what you're saying as far as like, say, a shop does a very good job of working with Facebook, Instagram, and they're generating a lot of sales through word of mouth through those sites. And, and that doesn't necessarily help them. If, if Facebook disappears, you know, like they still have a shop and the brand is maybe still known, like, how do you know, like to go to your web, their webpage or something? How, how do you help with like all that sort of branding? I guess word of mouth outside of the social media sphere. It all, it, this all changed again. This goes back to history, right? Newspapers, TV, radio, it's all the same thing. The atten- you go where the attention is. If Facebook and Instagram completely deteriorate tomorrow, which they won't, if they completely deteriorate tomorrow, cool, no big deal, man. Go find out where the attention is, find out where people are going, and go there. Then you market to them on that particular platform. If Instagram and Facebook die tomorrow, but Snapchat is still alive, you go to Snapchat and you market to them there. It, you just go where the attention is. It's that simple. All right. And then, uh, you know, we kind of touched on the different content. So, you know, branding yourself, um, you know, the different the different silos you call them of content to generate. How do you know which avenue to distribute that content through? I mean, you know, like they all kind of have like live video now and they all kind of have pictures and they all have, I guess they all don't have like, you know, Facebook still has the ability to write text, whereas Instagram is far more limiting on that. But I don't know. I'm not a very good Instagrammer, so I don't know that. Uh, <laughs> what, what avenues do you distribute this content on and, and, and justify doing it? There's not a blanket answer for that. The, the more specific answer is you find out where your customers are, and that's where you go. So let me put that in, into context. If, if your customers are 18 to 24, you need to be on Snapchat. If your customers are 24 to 36 and above, I won't get too specific on you, and above, Instagram, right? What is over-indexing on Facebook right now is above 34, 35, 40, 50, 60 year olds. That's what is over-indexing on, on uh, Facebook right now. Um, video in particular is fantastic on Facebook right now. It just, the return on that is just, it, it's amazing. Um, so you find out to answer your question, Kevin, to find out, you find out where your customers are, you map them out. You, again, going back to a discovery framework, you find out who those customers are, what their pain points are, where they're living, where their attention is. When you find out where their attention is, that's where you go. But keep in mind, uh, I believe it's called the Pareto principle, the 80, 20 rule. If you find out that they're on Instagram, they spend most of their time on Instagram at some point they're going to move away from Instagram. And I'll tell you why. Because everybody else, everybody used to be on Friendster. And everybody went from Friendster to MySpace. MySpace, man. And yeah. Then, remember and that? Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> and then from MySpace, they went to Facebook. Mm-hmm. 
and they just built a conglomerate. Even if Facebook screws up everything from now until eternity, they're still going to be alive for the next five years. So this whole this horde keeps moving. So back to the Pareto principle. You put 80%, 80% into Instagram, and then you put the remaining 20% into what you think their, where their attention is. If you think their attention is going to Snapchat, jump on Snapchat, get familiar with the platform. Don't try to build a, a brand or, you know, don't try to build a huge following yet. Just get familiar with the platform itself and how to storytell on the platform. Okay. And then on to the last topic here, uh, paid advertising. Um, it's definitely hard to do. And you kind of touched on really focusing the, you know, who you're advertising it to. What do you find, especially for like performance shops and, and manufacturers in our racing industry, what do you find to be the most effective way to advertise? Is it Google? Is it Facebook? Is it Instagram? What, what's the best way for us to really put our money into? It's damn sure not magazine ads and it's damn sure not banner ads. I can tell you that. Influencers, Facebook dark posts, and uh, just general content in general. Um, so I've mentioned influencers before to people and they're not quite sure what that means. So I'll try to explain it briefly here. An influencer in the context of this conversation is somebody that is involved. If you run a shop that specializes in Porsche, you find a person on Instagram or YouTube and the primary focus of their, their content is around Porsche, you hire them, you pay them to post content around your product or your service. So if you have a certain set of wheels that are made specifically for the GT3, you pay them 100, 300, a thousand dollars, whatever, to create content around that product. And I'll tell you why, because their fan base, they have all of the attention. They've already generated loyalty from their fan base. They don't have to buy it. They don't have to generate. It's already there. What that influencer says, the, his fan base will will put weight behind it. So that's so, it, it. Sounds almost like sponsorship, except it's not. You're not just giving it to them. You're telling them to post it and market, do the marketing yeah. for you. Essentially, is what it is, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you can scale this to the moon. I would start off with one post or one video or whatever, what have you, just to test them out and make sure that everything's copacetic. Um, but you can scale it to the moon and back. You can dump as much money into it as you want. Um, maybe it's a conversation for another day, another show. But if I had $10,000 to spend on quote unquote sponsorship, I wouldn't even put it on behind a driver. I'd put it behind an influencer, assuming that driver is not an influencer. I'd put it behind an influencer. Like Ken Block is a great example of an influencer, but it also a driver, right? He's both. Yeah. I mean, I guess I am kind of a, a, an influencer for Optum Battery. So they have a, a Power Pro ambassador. So people who are representing a, a specific market they have like different events that they put on and they invite us to all these things and going to all these different events. And, you know, in return, they ask for us to, you know, like make posts about, um, you know, their batteries and the products that they put out. And, you know, like, so it's, it's, it doesn't take a lot of my time and they invite me to all these cool things and it, it really allows me to, you know, participate in the stuff they do yet they do the marketing through me. Right. And that's kind of what it is, right? It's exactly what it is. Um, and I was in that position three years ago with, uh, the Chrysler 200 Chrysler invited, uh, me and girlfriend, Amanda, they invited us out to do uh, test drives with the new 200 that they were about to release. And, and that was it. That's exactly what they're doing. They're pulling it. They're paying for influencers to come out, test drive the, the product, and then create content around it. Interesting. Okay. So let's move on to our uh, more about yourself. Um, we'll kinda, we kind of uh, end the, uh, the focus topic here and we'll move on to yourself. So what's something you struggle with in business and how are you dealing with it? I think the main thing that I struggle with, and, and again, this is, is pretty personal, is that I was never trained in this. Again, my, my background is graphic design. Like I'm extremely visual. So learning traditional business, um, customer acquisition, employee management, et cetera, that's a really, really high 
a very, very steep learning curve for me. And what I've learned is that, and you've probably learned this and everybody that's listening, you guys are probably way ahead of me, but it's taken me a really long time to learn this firsthand is that, you know, if I can't do something well, then I need to bring the people in that can do it well. And that's what I've done. I've brought in the people that can do it well. So that's, that's been a huge, huge challenge for me. And honestly, the, the other thing that's a big challenge for me is this. Actually speaking, like, <laughs> as ironic as it sounds, like me speaking to you, speaking to a podcast, speaking to a microphone, speaking in public, it, I'm introverted. Like I'm extremely introverted. I would love to sit in front of my computer, head down, blasting away, taking over the world for 14 hours a day. That's my dreamland. However, I love personal development. I know that for me to succeed and to hit the goals that I have set for myself, I have to grow. So I'm putting myself in uncomfortable positions like this to do just that. Okay. And we like to take action on Do It For a Living. Can you suggest an action item for our listeners that they can take away to improve their situation? Reverse engineer your customers. That that's how you that's how you improve. That's that's the action point. You can do that right now. Okay. Um, some of the examples that I gave earlier. Try not to sell so much. I know that sounds counterproductive, and it goes against everything that's in your DNA. Like it's it's very much fight or flight. You feel like you have to sell, 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 sell. But it's very short sighted, and there and the way the market and our culture and technology is moving so quickly. That rug can get yanked out from under you tomorrow if you're, if you're based purely on sales. So mm -hmm. there's a massive amount of opportunity and value behind building a brand, um, both financially and, and else. Like, but to do that, you, you really have to reverse engineer the customer itself and make their life easier. If you can make their life easier, everything else will just kind of fall into place. That's been my mission with my software. <laughs> make people's yeah, lives easier. Okay, let's move on to the quick answer questions. These just kind of say the first thing that comes to your mind. So tell us a game-changing product you've seen in the last year. And this can be anything. I know you don't necessarily work on cars, but what can what have you seen? You know, I like um this probably isn't game-changing, but uh the Fortune, Fortune Auto came out with some coilovers recently for the S chassis. And most coilovers that come out for the S chassis, as far as I'm, I've seen, have been just static coilovers. Their coilovers have this pocket, uh, this hydraulic pocket that raises and lowers the car an inch and a half mm -hmm. um, at the flip of a switch. So it allows that particular car to go over a speed bump. And I know that's not too new, but in my world, like the drifting world where I, I spend most of my time, that's that's pretty awesome. So if I had to pick one product that is on my radar, it would have to be that one. Cool. And what software are you using daily? Oh, my phone. Does that count? I'm on it constantly. That was the second question or third question. What's your favorite app? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Instagram. Um, I if you were to if you were to go to any social media app, I, there's a good chance I'll be on there or will be on there under Studio Road. But uh, if I had to pick one. Um, Instagram. I spend a lot of time there. Okay. And what kind of car do you drive now? It's funny you ask that. Um, I had a, I had a unicorn, what I would consider a unicorn. I had an 06 Subaru Outback turbo wagon, five speed, silver on black, had 112,000 miles on it. And it gave me like, I, I spent four months buying this car, finding the car. It, it took me four months. And I finally got it and I had nothing but problems with it for a year <laughs> and a half. And it, it was really upsetting. I sold it a couple months ago. Um, so, uh, last week, actually, I went down to Atlanta. I bought a 04, uh, BMW E 46, 325 I, uh, black on black, five speed, 102,000 miles. Uh, I'm pumped on it. I really love the car so far. Um, that's my daily. My track car is a 1986 Toyota Corolla GTS coupe. And track car, you, you're drifting it, right? Right. Uh, it's not a coupe. I'm sorry. It's a hatch. But yes, it's uh, as of right now, it's I mean, it's a it's a track car. It's gutted, caged, all that good stuff. Oh, but uh, cool. it's set up at the moment for drifting. Okay. And what do you think the future of automotive performance is going to be? Massive opportunity. 
there's <laughs> when people I okay. So our our peers who we admire and love, our peers are very, very scared of what the future holds. Um you know, there's a younger generation that necessarily doesn't love cars the way we love cars. There's electron, there's electric and there's autonomous cars that are coming out that are being developed with Tesla and everything. But that's a conversation that's been had for decades. You know, the secret, the secret is to simply embrace the change. That's where the opportunity comes into play. So don't be the guy, don't be the guy that bought 500 horses the day after the car was invented. <laughs> that dude lost. He's, he lost. <laughs> so every, every single person, every single person that is listening to this right now sees where the industry is going. We all see it. You have a choice right now. You can either choose to embrace it and adapt and pivot or you can fall. Like that's it. You can be the guy that brought, bought the 500 horses the day after the car was invented. Now this is a, this is still a, a ten you know five ten fifteen year play, but start thinking about it like start putting stuff into place to make this pivot because it's going to happen, and so the way I see it, there's a massive amount of opportunity. When the economy drops, when when chaos hits, that's when opportunity presents itself. Okay. And to finish this thing off, how do we connect with you and the company? StudioRoad.com. Um, but what I would really enjoy. StudioRoad.com will send you everywhere you need to go in regards to the company. That That's all fine. What I would really enjoy is interaction. I would love for people to, to send me feedback. You know, I, I enjoy the feedback, what I sucked at, <laughs> what I was good at. Um, do they have questions? What, um, you know, if they have a problem, I'll try to answer it the best I can. So to do that, Chris at StudioRoad.com and... Um, the last couple of weeks, I started my own podcast. Uh, it's uh, it's on iTunes. It's the Automotive Aftermarket Masterclass. Uh, there's only three episodes there now. Um, I'll see what I can do about getting some more up there. But there, uh, nevertheless, there's still some value there. And that was the one that was originally the webinar, right? You called it the masterclass that, for that? Correct. Yes. Yeah, so that, that has morphed dramatically over the last two months. It started off as a very private um, webinar series. And I quickly realized that I needed to pivot myself and, and make that publicly available to everybody. So that's what I did. Awesome. Well, Chris, I really appreciate you taking the time and uh, sharing your story and kind of giving us some insight into marketing and design for our shops. It's been an honor, man. Thanks for listening to do it for a living. You can find out more about this guest this show, and even details about what we just talked about at our website, doitforaliving.net. Check out the Facebook page at facebook.com slash doitforaliving and tell us who you want to hear from. And most importantly, subscribe to the podcast. Click subscribe. Do it now. Seriously. I'll wait while you grab your phone. Open up the podcast app. Tap the subscribe button. When you subscribe, you help us gain momentum.